Hey guys, I'm Jordan Ritchie and I'm an animal care specialist here at Three Lakes Nature Center and today I'm going to be talking to you about the Eastern King Snake. So that is this guy right here. So as you can see, he's kind of a blackish color with this pretty um, yellowish white chain link pattern on his back. So that is um, typically their patternization and when these guys are juveniles, they have the same patterns as adults. So a lot of times in snakes you'll see um, the juveniles have a different pattern than their um, grown-up counterparts. These guys have the same pattern their entire life. Um, so their full-grown size, this guy is an adult, um, so they're about three and a half to four feet, um, a little under four feet actually. So kind of a mid-body sized snake for our area. Um, and this species does not have any sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism means that there is a very apparent um, distinction between the males and the females. So these guys, this species, the males do tend to get a little bit bigger, but it's not super noticeable. And unless you have one of each gender in front of you, um, you're not gonna be able to determine if it's a male or a female. So they live in the orange portion of the map. So Virginia all the way on down to Florida and a little bit over to Alabama. So that's where you'll find this type of king snake. There are several other species throughout the United States. Um, so these snakes are kind of habitat generalists. They will spend most of their time in forested areas near um, bodies of water, but they're not swimming or anything. They just need it for um, to help them find food and also to um, drink water. So typically they will be hiding under things. They are not um, very good climbers. You're not going to find them up in trees or anything. So generally you'll find them under logs or hiding in um, hollow logs. Anything on the ground that they can get under, they are going to try and hide. Since they live here in Virginia, they do hibernate during the winter. And so typically this time of year, they will start, um, start hiding. They'll still come out when it's the occasional warm day. Um, and then once it's cold consistently, they will spend the summer, or the winter rather, um, underneath. Usually they'll hibernate in a cave or under a log, anything like that. Um, so one of the reasons that they are actually called king snakes is because these guys will eat other snakes. So they're an awesome snake to have around because they actually will also eat venomous snakes. So they will help keep the venomous population down and um, they also will eat turtle eggs, they'll eat lizards, skinks, basically anything they can catch, mice. Um, they're not too particular about what they're gonna eat. Um, they also have predators of their own, so they will typically be um, on the lookout for, to hide from um, large birds of prey. Um, if they are a juvenile, they will watch out for larger king snakes because they will also cannibalize the lead their own kind. So those are the main predators and humans, of course, um, who kill them accidentally. Um, raccoons and possums also will go after um, younger um, king snakes. All right, so some cool adaptations for these guys. So we talked about how they are, um, they will eat venomous snakes. They're actually completely immune to pit viper venom. So the three venomous snakes we have here in the state of Virginia, the copperhead, the cottonmouth, and the rattlesnake are all parts of the pit viper family. So they have those little heat sensors on their face that help them detect prey. These guys are completely immune to the pit viper venom. So if they get bit during the struggle, they're completely fine. They have no, any, no reaction at all. So that's an awesome adaptation that these guys have. Um, some other general snake adaptations. Um, the tongue flicking that I'm sure you've noticed um, is actually an adaptation for them. So the tongue flicks out and collects molecules in the air. And then they have this special organ in the roof of their mouth called a Jacobson organ. And with that, they flick the tongue, collect the molecules, and then flick it to the roof of their mouth. And it tells them a lot about their environment. It tells them um, if there's food nearby, if there's potentially a predator nearby. It also tells them if there's maybe 
um, a female nearby if they're interested in mating. So they get all kinds of information about their environment from the tongue clicking. So that is a really cool adaptation they have. Um, another is their jaw and teeth. So they have extremely flexible jaws. So I think it was, if we had the jaw flexibility they did, we'd be able to swallow a basketball. <laughs> so that is why they're able to eat things that are much larger than the size of their heads. Um, and also their teeth. So most people, when they think of snake bites, they think of the two fangs. And that is only true for um, the venomous ones because they use the fangs to deliver the venom. So non-venomous snakes still have teeth, but they have these little itty bitty teeth that face backwards. And so while they're swallowing, those teeth kind of help push the food back down towards the end of the throat so that they can swallow it. All right. So reproduction wise, these guys mate in late spring and then they will um, lay eggs in late June. So typically they'll have about 10 to 15 eggs. So with most reptiles, they do tend to have a lot more eggs um, because most of them are not gonna make it to adulthood. So that's why with sea turtles and some others, you see they have a large number of eggs and offspring so that some of them will make it to adulthood. Um, so the eggs, they'll lay them at the end of June, they'll incubate for about two months in a nest, and then they will hatch in late August. All right, and so one other thing about snakes is the, um, that they shed. So their skin doesn't really grow with them. So when they get to be a, a little bit bigger, they will shed their smaller skin for the larger skin underneath. So. Typically juvenile snakes will shed a lot more often because they're growing a lot more. So um, once a snake reaches adulthood, they'll shed occasionally, but not nearly as frequently. Um, so some signs that your snake is going into shed, their eyes get kind of a cloudy color. It'll turn kind of a whitish blue and get kind of milky looking. And then the patterning itself kind of gets a dusty look, like they look kind of dirty and dull and they usually will stop eating around that time as well. And then once they kind of go through that process, the eyes clear up and then a couple days later, they will shed their skin. So typically they'll kind of rub their face on things to get the process started. So they peel back the skin from their head and ideally it should come off in one whole piece, but depending on the environment they're in, if there's not been a lot of rain and it's not super humid, then um, they sometimes will have trouble shedding and it'll come up kind of piecey. But um, they also do not have eyelids. So when they shed, they shed the top layer of their eye as well, which is kind of why you see that milky color. Um, they will excrete kind of a lotion in between their old skin and their new skin, and that kind of helps them to get the skin off. Um, and if you ever find a snake skin, it is not always accurate to the size of the snake. Um, they do stretch when they are being shed. So the skin can be a little bit longer or bigger than the snake that it came from. All right, so these guys typically live five to nine years in the wild, but in captivity, they've been known to reach um, early 30s. So they are pretty long-lived species in captivity. Um, and not too much is known about their population. Um, they don't have any protection status. They're not threatened or endangered or anything at this point, but they are an awesome snake to have around and they help control all the venomous and rodent populations. So we're glad they're here in the state of Virginia.